Well, again, it's, it's a new experience for us. We've talked about international capitalism, but uh, what we were talking about was much more restricted than what we have and much more defined. And not only that, but within those limits, you could sort of fix responsibility. Uh, now, you really don't know from week to week who owns you know, any corporation. It's, it's sold and traded almost uh, uh, like uh, cattle. And it may be owned by the Swiss one week and by the New Zealanders the next week or by the Japanese the next week. And it's all in this mix of, of uh, multinational and, and international capitalism, uh, which comes very close to what was described by Marx in his criticism of kind of the ultimate stage of capitalism when uh, the system itself would take over and no one person could be responsible. Is that where we are today? I think that's pretty close to where we are, and, and you get it manifest in things like this. The three factors of production, land or resources, the capital and labor, that the only one now that, that uh, seems to disturb people, or at least the Wall Street Journal, is what happens to capital. If, for example, with reference to trade, they discover that capital or investment is being subsidized in some other country, they protest that. But if labor is being exploited, and that exploitation reflected in what a company or a country is putting on the world market, they're quite indifferent to it. They say, well, we have to have more productivity, or the labor factor is being uh, overpaid. Or if the land factor is uh, resources are being exploited, they're indifferent to that. So it narrows down really to, to how capital is treated, uh, and uh, it's the one uh, Non, non-real factor. It's a projection. It's it's a it's a con, it's a con, social or, or ideological construction, which now has bec become the dominant force in international trade. Uh, this all of this dislocation is this resulting in an evaporation of our historical value system. The we well, so uh, if you're talking just about the trade and international uh, competition, it's curious saying, uh, I suppose everybody will make, be making references to the American Revolution and the Constitution, but a part of the object of the revolution was protectionism. It was to protect the American economy and American industry and production from being exploited by the British, who were the international capitalists of the day. And now protectionism has become a, a nasty word. I mean, it's, uh, it's in the headlines in all the papers, particularly the commercial papers. Uh, and it's a strange thing to, to, to have it used that way when the whole history of the country was one of, of exercising a decent sort of control over the operation of the economy, particularly in international trade. Who is behind the protectionism then? Well, I mean, the anti who's against it? Yeah. Well, it's really pretty much the the uh, multinational international companies. Um, the Italian who wrote the book, The Name of the Rose, has a collection of essays out now called uh, Travels in Hyper Reality. And he's talking about terrorism, which bears on this. And he said that the Red Brigade, which is a, is a real terrorist crowd, I mean, they're just pure terrorists, the Italians. They don't, they're not like the 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 Irish and who are IRA who have a particular political cause, and they're not like uh, some of the uh, uh, Middle East people who have historical cause or religious cause. They sort of believe in 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 terrorism against the system, and he said they have have concluded uh, the Red Brigade that there's nothing to be gained by uh, killing a head of state or a high official in one country because the multinational lives in all countries, or in many countries. So if you kill all the heads of state, it might do something. But so far as the operation of the system, they simply transfer it to, to another country. Or to, to kill or take a captive the head of a corporation in one country or one company, it doesn't affect the system because they shift it to another country. Or even to close down the whole operation in one country they can move the production or whatever it is to another country. And that the, 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 the Red Brigade people say that to be effective, 
they have to have a kind of total terrorism, but that won't work because when they go to the terrorists, or what they call terrorists in Ireland or in Iran, these people say, well, we're not pure terrorists. Uh, we have a political purpose or an historical purpose or a religious purpose. And the, his theory is that, that the, the terrorism uh, in, in, a, in a kind of multinational world such as we have in which the whole power is diffused and unidentifiable uh, is ineffective. Mm. Well, does this mean <clears throat> that this onward rush uh, via the uh, multinationals uh, is unstoppable and is going to mean a reduction in the uh, standard living of the American people, uh, or? Well, I, I, it appears to be unstoppable. At least there's no evidence of, of our putting an effective curb on it or redirecting it. I would think that eventually, and it, it, we, we do know that real, real wages or real income in this country have gone down in the last roughly 10 years, but there may come a time when we really have to answer for it in, uh, when we're called upon to pay our debts. Uh, we know it happens to people who have personal debts. They reach a point where when they have to pay off the mortgage and their other obligations, their standard of living sometimes is forced down. The same thing can happen uh, to a country, and uh, it's rather curious that the most popular investment in the world today is future tax collections in America. It may be the short-range genius of the Reagan administration that they've escaped the, the political charge so often made that you're putting a burden on the next generation. They're skipping one and putting it on the one after that, which is essentially defenseless. And I think it's a, it's the kind of political thing that uh, young people and college people uh, ought to be concerned about. They were. They're laying down a system in which you're going to have to pay uh, the, the credit burdens that are laid on you by a, not just a generation before you, but almost two generations before you. And it, it wouldn't be so bad if the credit was being used to, to raise money for investment, whether it's defense or otherwise, that would, would serve the generation after the next. But it, it's an investment that's always in the now. The uh, character of nuclear weapons, for example, is that they are all always either current or obsolete. They don't. You can't project them forward as you, as the French thought they could, the Maginot Line, saying this will give us security for 30 years. Uh, it didn't, but they thought it would. With uh, with current weapon systems, uh, the security is almost instant, and then it's gone. And so the people who feel they need that kind of security, ought to bear the cost of it and not try to lay it on another generation or two generations to follow them.